Wayne uh, brought a really great lesson that culminated in the uh, and speaking about giving and then developed that into something bigger than we characteristically think of. And uh, we need to be telling you that, that kindness has been pouring our way uh, to do what we're doing here. It's a wonderful thing. And uh, he spoke of imagination, and I'd like to pursue that uh, some. If those two fellows that went in that temple, if they had come in there with two sacks of gold staggering under it, and dropped it at that guy's feet, moved on, and never saw him again. They would have robbed him. They would have robbed him. Now, no doubt the gold would have done him all kinds of good, and he would have thanked God for that. All of that, we get that. I can hardly bear a religion that suggests we shouldn't enjoy the gifts of God, whether it's health or happiness, family, and all of those things. These are gifts of God. And anyone who will teach that we shouldn't rejoice in those in thankfulness is an idiot. Yeah. So I'm in favor of our friendships. I'm in favor of all that, and as you are, for pity's sake. All of that we rejoice in. But if they'd given him gold and given him a lot of time and they get a ped all the way around him and all of that, they would have robbed him. And if they had said, oh, you want to be healed? Yes. And they healed him and, that, and just said, okay, we're going to heal you. And off they'd go. They would have robbed him. You know where he is now? You know where Bojangles is now? He's dead. He doesn't dance physically anymore. What they offered him was not. He would have thought, oh, I'm going to get money. We think, oh, no, 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 he's mistaken. They're going to give him the ability to leap and, and soft shoe and all the rest of it. No, we're wrong as well. In the name of Christ, they come to him. And that fellow may not be physically dancing right now, but they gave him the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a day coming when in a post-resurrection life, he'll be dancing and nothing will be able to stop him. Mm -hmm. You see what happened there? You know what I'm telling you, you know. I'm not telling you anything new. I don't know anything new. That's the whole thing. I only have one sermon. That's all there is about it. But it's one sermon with all kinds of reasons to go on. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh God. What we saw, what we read, what we would have seen if we'd been there, we would have not just seen a miraculous healing. We would have seen two worlds in collision. Everywhere, beggars all over the place. And uh, this wee man, it was a normal old guy, 14,600 dads. Get this. You know, his friends all carried him. They didn't carry him for a week or for a month or for a year. They carried him for 14,600 dads. He's a bit over 40. And they're carrying him and putting him in his spot. Hey, who wouldn't have given up? And no doubt, he was looking for money. So you wouldn't expect that. This was just an ordinary day, start night, and it and a different way. But now he's somewhere else. He's with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not in a body yet, but he's happily waiting for the day when this all occurs. What I want to say is what you've heard, no doubt again and again, but it's the practice of it that's the real issue. Imagine. Imagine, use your imagination, read scripture, not only to get the, 
Um, okay, let's do some exegetical work here. Let's do some lexical work. We'll do some syntax work. We'll do this, and that, and the other. All of that's important because we want to hear what he said. But after we've heard exactly what he said, and we stay faithful to what he said, then we expand that. We think about it. Here's a, here's a text that really, uh, there are loads of these. There are loads of these. But here, here's a psalmist. Get this. Get this. Oh, that's not the one I want. It's this one here. My, I'm doubling pages. Here it is. Here it is. 117. No, 114. I'll try 114. It's got to be 114. That's where I read it. Here it is. Listen to this. This is all common to you. You know what this is as soon as I start reading it. When Israel went out of Egypt, now you know the whole story, don't you? You know what happened. All right. Here's how he tells it. Listen to this. This fellow knows what happened historically and physically and all of that, the way you know it. He knows it better, but you know it very well. He starts with Israel went out of Egypt. We've got that. The house of Jacob from a people of strange language. We've got that. They were using all the hieroglyphics. They were using all the Egyptian language. We, we get all of that. We get all of that. That's an old story, is it? Yeah, here you go. Judah became God's sanctuary and Israel his dominion. The sea, here we go. Here we go. The sea saw it and fled. Oops, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I did too. For when you go back to Exodus, you hear that a great wind, probably tornado, but maybe hurricane, and he opens up the water with a great wind. Yeah, he doesn't say that. He says, the sea saw it and fled. In the text, Moses and the guys come to the sea and they say, move, we're coming across. The sea said, go around. And God says, they're not going around. We're coming through. And, and away he goes and he comes through. It's all imagination here. But, but, but to tell the old, truthful, actual, historical story, that is right. And you do that, and I do it, and we do it, and we tell it all the time. But it's bigger. It's bigger than the actual fact. You're seeing invisible power, opposing invisible power. Power. It isn't just historical deeds. Praise God, it is historical deeds, or we wouldn't know anything about it. We get to see it. And what happened? Well, Israel came out of Egypt, they headed into the wilderness, they headed all into Canaan. Yeah, that's what happened, but this is what happened. What happened? The sea, <laughs> the sea. <laughs> The sea saw it and flat. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine the sea standing up, getting his running shoes on and running? Tell that to the children. Tell that to whoever you have influence with. Tell it to the children. Don't be afraid of imagining. The Bible does it. This is only one place. All over. Have you read how God expresses his judgment on Edom in Isaiah 34? Maybe not. But when you get a chance, read Isaiah 34 and how God describes the judgment on the empire, the nation, not every man, woman, boy, and girl, but on the empire, Edom. And see how he describes it. And then in Isaiah 11, he says there's a great day coming. You know how he describes it? 
Everybody's going to have their own fig tree. Babies are going to be 100 years old. How old are they going to live to if they're still babies at 100? They're going to be living on and on and on. He said babies will go down there and they will play with snakes. Everybody, and if a man dies at 100 years old, it's because he asks for it. This is how they describe the whole thing. Don't be afraid of imagination. Don't be afraid of telling it your own words. As long as I maintain the truth with the text, as long as I am telling the truth that the text tells, it's perfectly legitimate to imagine. And I saw a new heavens and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there wasn't any more sea. And I saw the new Jerusalem, dressed like a bride for her groom, coming down out of heaven. And on he goes. And the text says then in verse 5, look, look, he that sits on the throne says, behold, I'm making everything new. Oh, this. And how does he describe it? The same way he describes it when he opens the book. John in Revelation 1 verse 7 and following says, I'm your brother. I'm fellow in the kingdom and in suffering. And how does he describe the suffering and the battling in Revelation? You know who we brawl against? Seven-headed beasts that come up out of the water. These, these, these forces, 200,000, 200 million of them crossing to attack the city of God. All of that, he describes it all oh, in imagery. Don't be afraid of the imagery. Tell the story. When the child asks you, when, when the young people ask you, well, what is heaven like? Tell them what it's like. Tell them anything you want to tell them. As long as you're telling them the truth about what is going to happen, one of these, well, how do you know it's really going to happen? Jesus Christ says, watch me, watch me. And we watch him. He's got this human body and all of that. And they're beating him up and all of that kind of stuff. And they're breaking his heart. and They're doing all of that kind of stuff. And then they take him to the cross. He said, are you watching me? And then he says to the fellow, today, paradise. And then Sunday morning, up he gets alive and a mortal, sends the heaven and says, I'm coming back for you, everything. And then we don't know, for I hasn't seen, 1 Corinthians 2, I, I hasn't seen, no ear has heard, nobody has in their hearts come up with it. The things that God has prepared for those that love him. God didn't go to all this trouble and come this far. When it's all over, big line, and there's a little present for you, and there's a little present for you, and there's a little present here, there, and whatever. You know. He didn't do that, and he doesn't give everybody an equally trivial gift for participating in the game. That's not what happens. It's not what's going to happen. Not if you can believe in Jesus Christ. Ugh. He said, the sea, they're coming out of Egypt. And we know the story. He says, the sea saw it and got up running. Uh -huh. The Jordan turned back. You remember when Joshua, you know the story. Joyce says, well, how do we get across? Is that flood and all the rest of it? 
<laughs> and they shut that for everybody. <laughs> Across on Trilon. Yeah. But <laughs> poor Jordan. <laughs> Listen to what Mr. Money goes on to say. This is Bible. Don't be afraid of this. Don't be afraid of telling it your own way. The boy says they haven't hold, then you remember. Dr. Biggs Bigsby is just dying. This is one of those hard working old timey doctors. The boy says to him, What? And he says, Evan Holden says to the boy, Well, if anybody's going to heaven, he made it. And the boy said, You think he's in heaven? He said, Oh, yeah. He said, What's it like? And Evan Holden begins to tell him, It's like David Brower's farm. You ever seen a farm? Lovely, just everything, big waving grain, no big rocks, not nothing, nothing that doesn't make good hard work. And everybody said, and in heaven, there will be no narrow minded people. There will be none of this envy, none of that garbage. He said, well, anybody died there? He said, only people that have died there is those that need to die. He said, that's what he put it. He said, and what's it like? He said, it's like David Brower's farm. You know, you know what her favorite, uh, Linda, Linda, I forget where I'm pointing. Uh, you, you know Linda's favorite metaphor right now? It's uh, the shires where the hobbits live, the wee houses and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> oh, for pity's sake. And this great stuff here, 114. The sea saw it and fled. Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped. Like rams, older, toughies, you know, mountain, big old job. They skip like rams. And the hills, the little hills, like lambs. I like that picture. I've seen, and you've seen them too. With okay. young lambs. Like they've got springs in their legs, you know. Yep, yep, over here, they're jumping all over the place. The vision of it, the joy of it, the strength of it, the glory of it, the happiness in it, only in this case, it's letting you know how they bounced around. They saw what was happening, and the hills, the rams, and the lambs were jumping all over the place. You know about earthquake. You know about the volcanic uh, notions of the area in Mount Sinai and that. Uh, but he says, you know what they're like? Let, uh, let, me, see, let me see what I can tell you. Hmm. Yeah, the, the mountains were bouncing around like rams, you know, butting their heads. Do you show you've seen that, haven't you? His goats do it. Yeah. So what? What? And then you see the lambs and the hill, all of that. Allow yourself to see. What? A Proverbs 11, 1. False weights are abomination to God. Honest stones that they weigh, you know, they weigh with stones. Honest stones are his delight. Don't tell me what it means. If, if, if you were to ask me or I were to ask you, what do you, when you read that, what I just quoted there, 11.1 one of Proverbs, false weights, false scales are an abomination to God. Good, honest scales are a delight to him. You know what it means. What do you see when you read the text? Use your imagination. And you see, God can turn an eyeball in these crooks. You know what would happen? You know what would happen if you saw somebody crooked, working old people over and that kind of thing. Make a man as a honor. See the text. Not only understand the text and get the words. Yes, yes. First, know what he said and understand what he said, but then see it. Two worlds in that one verse are colliding. The world of the crooks and the, and, and the, 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 the fraudulent, this, that, and the other, and the words of people who day 
after day do an honest job. Uh, there was a law against having bad weights because you can only use bad weights for one thing, to be a crook. Yeah. Two worlds. Please. I know I'm being repetitive, but I can't help it. I don't know where I'm going except that we're in the kingdom and we're heading in the right direction, right? What does he say? He says, listen, listen to this. Listen to this. This is Psalm 114. Listen to this. What ails you, O sea, that you run? <laughs> He's talking to the sea. What are you not well? <laughs> What's your problem? Hey, don't you love this? Of course you do. Of course you do. What ails you, O sea, that you fled? Who are you frightened of? <laughs> well, Jordan, what ails you that you turned back? O well, mountains, what had you skipping all over the place like rams and lambs? God made himself present. Nobody saw him. Nobody ever saw him, says Jesus in John chapter 1. Nobody ever, except the son who explains him. Uh, nobody ever saw God, but he made himself present. But it doesn't look like he's present. How do you know this is not all chance? There's not a hurricanes and tornadoes around, earthquakes, all of that. You can reduce all of these things down to physical material reality. You can do that. That's why the Marxian economist has taken the whole of the um, the, um, what am I talking about? And I'm coming out of Egypt. A word. Uh, Excellent. Thank you, my dear. I forgot the word Exodus. <laughs> Where, um, you, can, you can reduce the Exodus down to just bare events. You can do that. And if you don't believe, you can get away with it. it it's very smart and all of that. But do you know, do you know, God had good reason to tell the humans in chapter three of the book of Genesis, don't eat the tree of knowledge. <laughs> because you know what happens when we get so smart and get so, read so much and get all of this, we end up getting smothered, suffocated and drowned in our intellect. Yeah. And there are, there are brilliant people to write. They're reducing everything. I was telling uh, Stan and Linda, I was watching this Michio Kaku, who's the most popular theoretical physicist and cosmologist in America, maybe in the world for all I know. And you know what they're talking about? <laughs> you know what they're talking about? They're talking about quantum field theory, quantum mechanics. They're talking about quantum void. And in the quantum void, which is absolutely nothing there, you know, what is happening? Elementary particles are popping into being. Oh, you mean really actual material? Well, no, <laughs> there aren't any, but they're virtual. And so they explain, they've got all the words, they've got all the words, they've got all the jargon, they've got all the theories, they've got all the equations, and they're as smart as can be, and they can not talk to you, me, and anybody else. Oh, so they've recently dumped the smartest man in the world, his uh, doctor, Stephen Hawking. That's all like the one in mind. But they're smart, and they're, and they're really, really intellectual. The academics and the other realms of they all get, they've got all this stuff. And God said, don't eat of that tree of knowledge. It means death to you. Oh, excuse me. 
That's what happens. That's what happens when we become so smart and reduce everything. And God is nowhere and everything is something else. By God, we're not going to do it. And it always pleased me to think uh, of Jesus sitting listening to one of these fellas and how it all happened. Oh, oh and I, I, I forgot to tell you, Michio Kaku was sitting talking to this fella and the guy said, and so what, what, what is our universe? He said, well, it's like, a, it's like a big bubble. It's just expanding, a big bubble. And he said, there are millions and multiplied millions of bubbles. And with the probability theory, Listen to this, and then I'm going to leave this alone. With the probability theory, there's going to be another you, maybe a million you. I mean you, you. Give it enough time, everything will reoccur. Some years ago, I read where they made the point, I don't hear them do it much now, but they made the point that given a bunch of monkeys and given them you know, a jillion years, they would end up with a typewriter, presuming the typewriter would last and all of that. They would make the typewriter and they would come up with all the works of Shakespeare. I'm not telling you a lie. I'm telling you what they said. It would come all up with Shakespeare right from beginning to end, word for word. See? Look at that. But even if that were to happen, it wouldn't be what happened when Shakespeare came up with his because he intended and the poor monkeys there just whacking away. There's no intention there. Get smart, get smart, reduce everything, reduce everything down to there's no God anywhere. And you've gotten too smart. And God says, that is death. Eat of that and you're dead. And that's what they're doing. And they can knock, I talk to you and me. They can do it. You know, why? How can we speak? We don't talk about that. Well, if you're interested in that, you dabble in them, of course. But we don't talk about that. What are we doing here? Let's talk about virtual particles and <laughs> virtual particles. Let's talk about God and Christ, which is thankful what we attempt to do here, what you want to be here being done. This is who we are. It's who we are. And Jesus is alive. He's alive and he's glorified and he's coming. I don't want to live in this world, the way things are right now, it's not just trees and, and, and water and lovely things and birds and glorious things, all of that. I don't want to live in this world forever. Because he doesn't want us. Because we would be cheated. There's more ahead. Yeah. Do I, do I think we should uh, dismiss this life because there's glory ahead? No. Should we, should we feel sorry uh, about people's bereavement, uh, about their poverty and about their ill health? Yeah. Yeah. But to make that the last word is contrary, utterly and absolutely contrary to the purpose that God has for you. Look, I'm going to get, I'm, I'm, I'm old and I'm going to get older and I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to get all feeble and all that kind of stuff. And I'll be going off and Linda will have to be doing whatever it has to be done. I'm going to hate that. But she's going to be doing it anyway. Yeah. But I'm going to close my eyes. I don't know what's going to happen. By the grace of God, I'll open my eyes. I don't know what I'm going to see, but it's going to be great. Yeah. I mean, think of all the company you're going to be keeping. Think of all the, uh, what, Jillian's all singing. Not perpetually and on that. No, no, no. It's not going to be an all eternity prayer meeting or a song service. We're going to live and be alive. Tell it how you wish. Eliza Doolittle said, 
All she wanted was a room somewhere far away from the cold night air <laughs> with some big marvelous chair. Oh, and chocolates for her to eat. Now, wouldn't that be lovely? I think you can tell about heaven any way you want because why everybody, tell it to the young people and the young people will say, is that what it's like? Uh -huh. And yeah, well, and what would you like to do there? Oh, why well, I would like to play with. Yeah, they've got those there as well. And tell it to them. Tell it to them. Tell them not to be afraid of dying or moving. When they get up older, they will know. Of course, they will know. Well, she was just trying to illustrate for me, or he was trying. To, yeah, but it will shape them. They can feel good. There's a living, vibrant hope. Imagine, allow yourself to imagine, stay faithful. I'm not telling you that something you're not already doing. Stay faithful to scripture. Be unashamed of it as you now are. Open it up and rejoice in scripture. Read the stories and say, ooh, yeah. Enjoy your Bible study. Help others to enjoy the Bible study. You'll go in there, and the better and, and the more experience you get to be with it, the easier it becomes. And I'm not saying I'm knowing all of this. I'm just saying this is what will happen to you. you oh, this is great. And you begin to do it with every, not a reversal. You can't do it. But you'll be doing it with sections. You'll be getting in there, and you'll be seeing Rob Shakay outside Jerusalem and everybody up in Jerusalem all scared spitless and him talking about what we're going to do to you and all the rest of it. And you're going to be there. And then you're going to go to the next chapter and you're going to read what Hezekiah said to God. And you're going to think, whoa, that's what I needed to do. And he tells him, well, and you will tell it well, and you'll tell it well. And with your husband or your wife or whoever it is that's around you, you're reading and say, hey, look at this. And you'll start telling it in your own words, remaining true to the text. It's who we are. And what will that do for the future? It'll, it'll change the future. That is, it'll make it, you know, this, that, and the other. It'll also do something for you now. Now. Well, you get all excited and all emotional and all the rest of it, yeah, but emotion passes. Yeah, well, emotion does pass, yeah. But you remain changed. You're never the same person when you see a text and it becomes more. Oh. Yeah. Emotion is a wondrous thing. And well used, well experienced with the grounding of Jesus Christ and the scriptures about him, nothing, nothing stays the same. Nothing. Holy Father, what a python. You've given us an intellect, all of that, and we want to use it, for without it, we cannot be who it is you've made us to be. But we want you to shape our intellect and balance our intellect with heartfelt feeling where we will permit ourselves, and for some of us it's not easy, but you will permit ourselves to rejoice and feel free in reading your Word that lives and abides forever. Uh -huh. Help us then to be happy that we're happy. Help us when we're hurting and we're going through it and we're not very happy about that. Help us to say that that's okay. But help us to believe in you that all you ever wanted was to create us 
to be your everlasting companions mm. and live in wondrous adventure, mm. glory and mystery and speech and, and experiences. Mm. Believing that, believing that, because Jesus has exhibited historically for us. Mm. Believing all of that, we thank you. And we thank you with all of our hearts. And we thank you that you like us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, everybody. While y'all are unmuted.